Hi, welcome to Think Tech. We are raising public awareness about technology, energy, diversity, and globalism. This show is Center Stage. I'm your host, Donna Blanchard, proud managing director of Kumukuhua Theater. And we are coming to you live from Pioneer Plaza in the heart of downtown Honolulu, very near Kumukuhua Theater. I am excited to tell you that my guest today is Dr. Loretta Chen. She has a new book coming out called The Elam Chu Story, Driven by Purpose, Destined for Change. Loretta is not just an author, though. She's a professor, a motivational speaker, an executive coach, a creative director, production director, actor, and so much more. We're oh going to hear about all of that right now. Welcome, <laughs> Loretta. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Donna. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. This I've never is... heard all my. I've never heard all of that in one breath. So no, thank you. It's, it's, <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> There's a hear. lot to you. There's a lot to you, and I happen to know. I've read. I read your book, Woman on Top. Thank you. It's a really wonderful biography. Uh -huh. um, I have worked with you as an executive coach, and you do a pretty fabulous job with that, too. It's Thank been, you. It was a really uh, wonderful experience for me. Thank you. So I am looking forward to your next book and having this conversation with you about your recent travels yeah. and how you're taking on the world. What do you feel like? Let's start off with a small, light question. Okay, What do you sure. feel like is your purpose in the world? Um, good question. I, 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 since I was a child, like, you know, this high, I've always felt like I, I wanted to change the world. In fact, in one newspaper article, I said, I, I was probably like 18, I said, I want to change the world! And it was like the headline, and I was like, oh my god, I sound so cocky. But that was literally what I said, I want to change the world! But I, I, now that I'm older, uh, <laughs> I, I think what it is is that I, I feel my purpose is I have an ability to connect. I have an ability to, to create. I love creating. Um, and I think any... Um, position that allows me to connect, to create, to communicate, um, to allow me to, to change lives, um, better people's lives, um, inject positive, infectious energy. Uh, I, I, I truly enjoy it, whether it's in a classroom, whether it's in a theater. I started as a theater director. Mm -hmm. I took it to the classroom, um, and then it became something that I did in a corporate boardroom. Um, and now it's, it's, it's all of that, and community and society, and, and I'm loving every minute of it. Yeah. So you, you uh, are an adjunct professor at several different universities. Yeah. What are the classes that you're teaching? Uh, the one that I'm running currently now at the University of Southern Maine is called Centered Leadership and Entrepreneurial Woman. So that's something that, that I, I, I run every summer. Um, I also teach classes on leadership, on creativity and innovation. Um, when I first started, though, I was teaching classes in directing presentation skills, and that's what took mm -hmm. me eventually to the Kingdom of Bhutan, um, and that's a whole other story. But it was largely, we'll get there. We're going we'll to get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. So right now, largely leadership, entrepreneurship, creativity, innovation, uh, presentation skills, uh, uh, lots of motivational talks, going mm -hmm. into just rah-rah people. Uh, I love it. Yeah. How do you teach innovation? Very good question. You can't. I think what, what I do in my classes is to engage them. I, I, I truly am a hands-on learner. That's how I, I process. So a lot of it is, I think my technique is esoteric, but I think now the world is beginning to accept being a little bit more esoteric. When I first started, I incorporated my theater background, which means a lot of warm-up activity. Because back in the day, people would be like, why I'm in a leadership class? Why are you making me lie on the floor to <laughs> recognize my breath? But if you don't understand who you are, you don't understand how essential your breath is to you, you're not going to be aware of a lot of other things. So not to say that for every class I make people roll on the floor, but um, there's a component of the physicality, the, the tai chi, the yoga, the breath. Um, and then obviously there's an element, because I am very academic, there's an element of the philosophy, the theories behind it. But I think that the biggest learning, or the creativity and innovation, really comes when you know who you are. Um, what you what you really are like, what motivates you, um, what gets you, what gets your goal, um, and 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 once you know all that, you understand how you can rub off people and how you can can connect or don't connect with people. Mm. And once you have that fundamental core, um, you can then really say, okay, this is what I, I want to create. I want it to be a designer. But these are these are the. It's almost like doing a balanced scorecard to say, okay, these are my assets, these are my liabilities, um, and work on those liabilities and turn that into assets. And, and then you can really see your project take off. Because a lot of people say, okay, I want to be a designer, but maybe they don't realize that they can't draw, which is fine, because I can't draw at all. 
at all. But what I then do is I use my ability to connect and I get somebody who knows how to draw. I've worked with the best set designers, the best costume designers, the best hair designers. I, I can't draw at all. Everyone thinks that I'm a director because I can draw. I'm like, I can't draw at all. <laughs> uh, but it stems from intense personal self-knowledge. I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm not good at. And I'm never, ever shy to, to hire someone that is leaps and bounds better than me in a specific area that I, that I don't, uh, that I'm not good at. And, and I love harnessing those complementary energies and, and then magic happens. Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that, that sort of collaboration is getting so much, I'm sure that it's been around for yeah. millennia, yeah. but it's getting a lot more attention yes. now. It's being recognized as it's not us against them, it's us. It's That's just right. us. <laughs> That's right. And, and when you get people to take ownership, um, and, and with the millennials, it's all about, I need my ownership. And, and, but, but it is so fundamental because the whole divide and conquer thing for me has, has never really worked. I think my leadership training stemmed um, from my working as a theater director back in the days, as, as you would probably know. You don't have a lot of budget, and you had to create something out of nothing, and you had a deadline. You had paying audiences, they were going to sit there and watch you, and so like you had to back, borrow, steal, grovel, and make sure you got a show. There were days when um, I had an actor, I remember the story, I, I had an actor, she was my lead actress, she was, she was famous in Asia, and she came down with cancer. And, and she literally called me and she said, I, I can't go on. I'm so broken and I can't go on. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, just rest. I, I, two days before opening, I just rest, my dear. Um, I'll take care of everything. Hung up the phone. Oh my God, what's I going to do? I don't show what's I going to do. But I was really calm in front of her. Don't worry, I'll, I'll take care of everything. And the next thing I knew, I rallied everybody and I said, okay, so and so has cancer, but we've still got a show to deliver and you know, we're going to rally everybody. And it's nothing more powerful than when you're completely honest and vulnerable and you share what the problem is and instead of trying to, like, oh, you know, everything's really okay. And the team just got together and I became uh, the stand in actress. I couldn't speak a word of Mandarin. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> it, it, it was in Mandarin, right? I was, and I had to, and we had 48 hours to get the show going. Um, my costume designers had to turn around and get the entire costume, you know, uh, stitched up for me. But the point I was trying to make is I think uh, a lot of the leadership training that, that I had stemmed less from the boardroom but from my humble beginnings as a theater director because you recognize that you had to make something happen uh, with so little. And what really mo motivated my actors was passion, energy. And, and when I reciprocated and when I thanked them and I showed them how much I appreciated them because they worked for me for my ideas, um, I made them laugh and cry and tear and, 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 and bear their souls because they believed in me. And that in turn, fueled my desire to do my best for them, be the best mummy, daddy, you know, to them. Um, they were my children. And, and together we, we, we would make magic. And I took that same energy that could not be bought because there was not much money in theater. <laughs> and I took that and, and, and I think soon corporates begin to see, oh, there, there's something there because a pay, um, I have nothing against, you know, getting paid because later on I got paid pretty well. But my point is corporates begin to realize, oh, there's something, uh, about the kind of energy that we didn't see in commercial directors. And that's how I started getting gigs from like Samsung or Nikon or Louis Vuitton or LVMH. And I started directing the, these gigs. And obviously, they, they paid the bills and they started doing better. But I, I always remember my theater roots and I bring my theater actors in. And it became like a virtuous cycle because you had really passionate people that were going in and now they're getting paid. And it, it, and it was great to see the industry sort of grow and, and bloom as well. And, and gradually, I, I took on leadership roles as well in, in the corporate boardroom. But I think that fundamental um, beginning as, as a theater director has, has really just shaped me. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I to no, I totally see that. You, yeah. you don't, you have a shoestring budget. You have to get it together. Yeah. yeah. We, we all have our stories yeah. of the moment, yeah. the, the, you know, the roof caved in and you had to figure out how to right? get the show on anyway. And so, and, and you know, and that's the one thing that I often say, most times people will say, creativity means thinking out of the box. And I'll always say, yes, but I think you're really creative when you have to think within the box, when you have no budget, no actor yeah. uh, who's sick at home with cancer, and you still got to get a show going. Obviously, yeah. later on, when I did have the budget in Samsung and in Dubai, and you know, I was directing the Samsung Galaxy launch, when you do have the budget, you actually, it, it's easier, because then you have resources, you have money, you have budget, it's easier. But 
I think what trains you is when you don't have these things and oh, you yeah. have to think within the box and that's when you're, you really, it pushes your creativity to, to the max. And you understand the importance and of a deadline. And, and discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know which wise guy said it, maybe it's Einstein, but I think he said, you know, creativity is discipline having fun and I really think so. Mm -hmm. Um, and I truly think so. We always act as if we're having a lot of fun, but I think we're, we're very disciplined in what we do. Absolutely. Yeah. Some of the most disciplined people I know of are in theater. Yeah. We're going to take our first break yes. real quick. When we come back, we're going to talk about what led you to the book. Okay. Okay. We're going to be right back after a short break. Please stay put. We'll see you soon on Center Stage. Aloha. I'm Carl Campagna, host of Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I hope you join us over the next several weeks as we take a deep dive into biofuels in Hawaii and explore the alternative fuels supply chain necessary for the local and global transition towards transportation fuel sustainability. Join us as we have good conversations with our farmers, our producers, our conversion technologies, our investors, and our legislators as we try to achieve our transportation sustainability goals. See you soon. Aloha, I'm Chantel Seville, host of the Savvy Chick Show on Think Tech Hawaii. This show is for you. It's all about inspiring and empowering girls of the future to do what they love, get out there and be healthy, fit and confident. If you're up for that, 11 a.m. every Wednesday, I'll see you there. Hi, welcome back to Center Stage. I am your host, Donna Blanchard, and I want to let you know a couple of things. First, if you would ever like to join us in the downtown studio audience here in Pioneer Plaza, you may do so. Just email J, that's J-A-Y, at thinktechhawaii.com. If you uh, or anyone you know really should be on this show sitting here with me, then just send me a message. You can tweet me at It's All About Donna, and I would be really happy to talk with you. Okay, we're back with Loretta Chen, author, creative director, actor, Professor extraordinaire. Let's talk about the Elim Chu story, mm -hmm. Driven by Purpose, Destined for Change. That's yes. a fabulous title. What drew, drove you to Elim and her story? I think what happened was after Woman on Top, that was my first book that you, you, you read, um, I was actually very inspired and, and, and overwhelmed by the responses I had. And I spoke to a publisher and he said, well, do you want to write another book? And I said, yes! I don't know what possessed me to say yes, and before I knew what a three book contract. But I think it was also because I was moving to Hawaii, right? And I, and I knew that I wanted to stay connected to Singapore without being physically there. And writing was, was a good way for me to connect with my culture, my people, and yet not be physically there. So that, there was a logistics reason. But having said that, Elim is a, a wonderful person. Um, she didn't pay me to say this. Uh, <laughs> she is a social entrepreneur, and we connected, I think, a couple of years ago. I mean, we've always kind of known each other in, in the community. But we got together when I appeared on a, on a TV program called Body and Soul talking about depression. And she connected with me to say, hey, should we collaborate on a project? Because, you know, she really wanted to help, uh, you know, youths out there that suffer from depression. Now, just a little segue, Singapore is a very cosmopolitan city, um, very busy. Um, people live very fast-paced life, and as a result, they, they get stressed. Um, and it's also the Asian culture where you don't talk about um, your personal life. It's seen as a taboo or any kind of setback or failure. Um, you don't talk about it because it's a very almost stoic culture where you always want to present your, your best face forward, right? Which is not a bad thing. But what happens to a lot of people, um, youths or, you know, um, or not, um, internalize a lot of their pain and their anger and they, they feel very lonely. Um, and there have been um, an increased incidences of, of teen um, suicides. And, and it's very sad because they, they don't even reach the full potential of what, what they might become and, and they, they kill themselves over bad grades, stress from school, um, thinking that they've let their parents or society down mm -hmm. and they literally just jump off the buildings. So. Elam connected with me and said, let's do something about them. And we said, okay, let's do this. And we became really good friends. We talked story. And I said, you know what? Let's do your story. Because I think what we need is an, it's an, a voice, a champion, an ambassador. Because Elam, uh, kind of like me, we, we, we broke stereotypes, right? Um, she was a school dropout. 
and she ended up becoming a social, she ended up becoming an entrepreneur and then a social entrepreneur. So in, in a way, her story defies the social trajectory that, that we have in Singapore where you need to get a good education, only then can you become successful, only then can you go on to become an outstanding citizen. But you know, she was a school dropout. She didn't enjoy school one bit and she talked about it in the book. And I think we wanted to use that as a story um, for youths who feel disenfranchised just because they're not academic. Mm. So that's how this started. I said, let's talk about you. And before we knew it, I mean, the stories came out, and, and I said, well, let's, we, we got a book. We got a book, and, and here we are. Yeah. Oh, just like that. Just like that. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but also we, you know, she had a 30-year career called 77 Street. 77 Street was, back in the day, um, it, it, she retired from 77 Street this year in 2016, so she's had it for 29 years. Back in the day in the 80s and 90s, it was like the coolest hangout. I don't know what the equivalent here is Honolulu, but it's like the coolest hangout where you could get like, you know, um, uh, Guns N' Roses t-shirts or Metallica. And back in the day, like in conservative Asia, it was seen as, oh my God, is that a cult? Like, oh my God, you know, is that like satanic, right? But, you know, she catered to a population that was not looked to in Asia or in Singapore because people were only looking at the uh, she-she individuals that could buy the Chanel's and the Louis Vuitton's. But she was catering to the youths because back in the day in the 80s, nobody thought they had any money. Nobody thought that we should cater to the youths. Like, why would we? Right? And he kind right. of poo pooed them, and you sort of like, oh, youth is coming in, let's just look the other way, pretend we don't see them. But 77th Street catered to the youths, and it started this whole suburban youth culture, which is now like this whole millennial thing. I mean, it, it's, it's so much part of our, our um, intrinsic uh, culture, but back in the day, it, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we thought that'd be a great story as well. Um, so the book traces as well um, Singapore's development through the 70s, 80s, 90s to now, um, how culture has evolved, how pop youth culture has evolved. Uh, we also share about her business failures, her trials, her tribulations, um, because behind every successful entrepreneur, like even in my own book, I share it, um, that there's, there, there are always stories, right? We only think that someone's successful and we only see the entire packaging and think that, oh, they're just born with a silver spoon. They have it easy. But when you unravel, unpack, you realize there's a lot of, their tears shed, you know, um, heart, uh, heart, hearts are broken, and, and you, you draw strength and, and pull yourself back. And that's inspiring, and that's what we yeah. want to give back to, to the community. I think uh, I'm anxious to read this book. Yeah. Uh, I did enjoy um, Woman on Top, and Thank I think you. that they're both, um, anytime you tell someone's story, whether it's someone's rise up or their fall down or somewhere in between, the other, those stories resonate with us. We can all learn something from the other stories that we're here, as long as they are told honestly and with heart. Honesty, I think that's key. It's never talking down to. Um, it's, it's always about connecting, because remember I said I, I feel like I have a gift for it connecting, creating, communicating. And, and that's how I want to write my book. Whenever you read my book, it feels like it's a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and I, I, I hope you will get a chance to read it. I hope the viewers here in uh, Honolulu will get a chance to pick up the book as well. When does it go on sale? It goes on sale in Singapore on September 20th, I think. But it, I think the official launch is at September 13th, so it'll be in a press um, in Singapore. Uh, I think my publisher said we'll, we'll have the books on um, online, I think, in October, November. Oh, OK. Yeah. So soon. October, November. Yeah, very soon. Look forward to that. Yes. Let's talk about your trip, um, just so we cover as much material <laughs> as we possibly can. Okay. Yeah. I would like to talk about your trip to Bhutan. What took you to Bhutan? In 2012, um, I had very, two very good friends, Michael Chung and um, Chong Yun, Mark. Michael Chung was the ex CEO of MediaCorp Publishing, which is like our national printing press. Uh, he was in charge of magazines and, and the press. And I had a friend, um, Chong Yun, that was a financial guy. And they both went to Bhutan. And I said, oh, I want to go, of course, for unbridled passion. I'm like, I want to go too. So Mark sends my CV off to, to Bhutan. Now, and then I got a call. I, I remembered I was in Japan or Korea. And I got a call. And they invited me to Bhutan. And I thought, you know, okay, they're probably inviting me to like a community school. Not that there's anything wrong with that because I work at a community school. But I thought, you know, I was going to a community school or... And the next thing I knew, because Michael said, you know, when you do go to Loretta, you got to slow down, don't be so fast, because I'm always like huffing and puffing, right? <laughs> and he's like, you know, people there kind of relax, like calm down. And I said, okay, okay. So I got to Bhutan. I didn't realize that it was actually, because they explained to me, but I didn't really get it, right? 
And I realized I was working in the government. I was working with a government investment arm called DHI or Duke Holdings and Investments. So basically, this was like a, a think tank of the smartest, brightest, most experienced individuals in Bhutan. They put them together in a government investment arm. Um, and they, in turn, look to all the assets of the country. So whether it's a telco or um, the state trading corporation or the cement plant. But anyway, so I was tasked to go in to work on the presentation skills. Um, the media skills, crisis management, and eventually I got seconded to different agencies. I got seconded to Bhutan Telco, where I worked with them on marketing and branding and, and got them to understand marketing and branding. Um, and I also worked on um, leadership um, and, and development with the State Trading Corporation. And then I went on to work with the Cement uh, Company. Um, on same thing, leadership, organizational development. Um, and then they in turn seconded me to other places where I started going to schools to talk to youths. And so it just became one thing after another. And in the midst of that, I, I even founded a, a, an orphanage um, together with a friend of mine um, who's now like my brother, Mr. Chen Chu Tsering, who's the ex CEO of the, the press in Bhutan. And I, I helped to um, raise funds to build an orphanage. Oh, my goodness. And this was all over three months? Uh, no, this is all over four years. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. So from 2012, yeah, 2012 okay. to 2016, yeah, right? Three months. three months. I know, <laughs> I know, right? Why wouldn't I do it within three months? No, so this is during a span of four years, and, and I'm still very dedicated and com committed to, to Bhutan. I think it's changed me so fundamentally to, to see how simply pe people live, and, and they're happy, and they're content. Um, and, and, and the country believes in growth national happiness. And, I mean... They, they have their fundamentals packed. It's all about this life is worth living and we need to live it well and be happy. Um, and there's something so profound about that and you see it in practice. Um, and it, it's changed me how I am and I, I, I live that every day. And I, so I go back at least once or twice every year. I'm doing a documentary on Bhutan. Um, so I'm going back in November to, to, to do that. To do that. Yeah. Okay, so let me ask you about this. Yes, the um, women do not have an, an equal say in life uh, as men do in Bhutan, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder about the philosophy behind feeling happy and content mm -hmm. at the same time recognizing that you do not, you are not recognized mm -hmm. as fully yeah. as a, a man just because he mm. is a different gender. I don't know how much time we have, but um, in a nutshell, it is not, the gender inequality as, as with most cultures and societies is not as pronounces it's not like it, what I'm trying to say is in Bhutan it, it on the out, if, if you're not a if you're not part of the system you might immediately think that but once you understand how the system works it's actually very matriarchal in the sense that uh, when you walk into a household you know grandmama rules the household and mm -hmm. all the men are very differential to uh, mom, and they're also very respectful of their wives. But yes, I think when you talk about going out to the world, the working world, you do see that income, or you do see that gender disparity. You know, in the same way, I don't know if I can say this on air, but I am, is when I worked with a certain uh, very known Korean company um, that runs um, telcos and other things. When I was wor working with them as a creative director, I, I witnessed how women actually literally took a couple of steps back behind mm -hmm. the, the, their senior management. I observed that. Um, it's not right or wrong, but I observed that. But I was allowed into the network of the CEO and the head of marketing because I was not a I was not part of the community. I was seen as an invited guest. So I could speak with them. You didn't have to walk I didn't a have couple to, of steps yeah. behind. Uh, so I don't think it's just Bhutan. I think it's something um, that I have observed in most parts of the world that I, I travel to. Um, it, there is almost like a distinction between when you, when you step into the inner sanctum or the homes, you can see grandmama ruling the household. But the minute you walk out to the work sphere, um, you know, it, it, there is a difference. And I think we will probably need a whole other session for me to unpack that in more nuanced terms. <laughs> yeah, sorry to throw yeah. that one at you. But, but no, but I, 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 I appreciated that, that, yeah. that question tremendously. But yes, to answer your point, um, I do think that women in general do need to be more educated to become confident. 
um, because for centuries and, and even today I've seen so many communities, they, they take the back seat and they, they push their sons forward. And I'm like, no, your daughters too, mm -hmm. you know, not just your sons. I think there is still that tendency to, to do that. And I think women need to make that change and make that call and recognize that if they don't step up and lean in, um, they're going to raise a whole generation of, of, of girls that are always going to want to take a back seat. A and whole another generation. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, then you'll have to come back and I'll we'll talk about that. I'll have to come back and then we can talk in more nuanced <laughs> terms for sure and, we'll I will, and I will love to. Okay. It, it is an important issue. It's very close to my heart. It is. Yeah. And the idea yeah. of stuffing yeah. emotions. Yeah. You know, yeah. and what that does. Yeah. That, 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 that when All it's part of, of your, when it's part of of your culture, it's what you do. It However, is. those emotions have to go somewhere. Yes. You have to do something with them eventually. You do. I'm you do. learning all about that in therapy right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for being here. Thank I want you. everyone to, your, your book, Woman on Top. Yes. Um, it, that's available on that's, Amazon? That's available on Amazon. That's I think it's available, available as an ebook version as well. And um, Alan Chu's story, Driven by Purpose, Destined for Change, will be out. And all good bookstores in, in Asia and Singapore, I think, next week or September 20th. But I think it's available online from October and November. Okay. Yeah. Everybody should look for those and look for the next fabulous things that are coming from you. Um, and thank you very much for being here, you and Loretta and everyone else. There's a few people here in the studio I would like to thank. Our floor manager, Nick Sexton, who's right over there. Thanks, Nick. I'd also like to thank Zuri Bender, our studio overlord, who is in my ear, and Jay Fidel, who somehow manages to put all of this together. We will see you next week here, 2 o'clock on Wednesdays on Center Stage. Bye.